This civilization occurs in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. When we speak of Mexico, however, you must get it very clear in your mind that we're not speaking of the shrunken Mexico of today. We speak of Mexico when it was the very core and heartland of Native American civilizations. A Mexico that included parts of Colorado, parts of Texas, parts of California, going right up to La Plata in Canada. This civilization known as Olmec was to touch all other civilizations in America, the Maya, the Toltec, the Aztec, etc. It was even to stretch right out into South America. What is very unusual about this civilization was that not only was it the mother of American civilizations, but it contained elements that were not just native to America, but was a fusion between the Native American and people coming from outside. The most significant of those outsiders were the Africans. We have very clear evidence in stone heads, in terracottas that are clay sculptures, as well as skulls and skeletons of an African physical type entering that native population somewhere between 948 and 680 BC. How do we know the date? It is because on one of the platforms in the holy center and capital of the Olmec world, a place called the Venta, we were able to date the stone heads because they were rooted in a wooden platform where the Americans oh. worshipped and we got this dating of 948 to 680 BC. Now, several people have wondered what kind of Africans these were. Who were these outsiders? These were largely Egypto-Nubian types, at least that type was in command. Because what we do find in the evidence is that not merely the presence of this physical type, which is African, but the presence of cultural elements, which we will talk about in this program, which are clearly of Egypto-Nubian origin. And the question arises, why do we include Egypt among classically African civilizations? There is now absolutely no doubt that the ancient Egyptian civilization was overwhelmingly African. They have found the kingdom of Tarseti, in the Nile Valley, where all the major elements, political and religious elements, spring out of the Egyptian, spring out of the south of Egypt, spring out of the Nubian world, at Kustal in Nubia, where we have about a dozen black kings reigning before the first Egyptian dynasty. Even the hieroglyphs, the writing system of the Egyptians, we find they have their roots in the Sudan, so that as the Africans move up from Nubia, they go into Egypt, so that we find the African, not only in the evening of Egyptian civilization, but in its very dawn. And we find them also at the, in the noon dynasties. This is very important because it's important to understand that the Egyptian thing, the Egyptian miracle, was not only to touch Europe, not only to touch Asia, but was to stretch out to America as well. At the beginning of this museum, I was made the information about from the picture, from where they got at the face. Then, when we was passing in the other house, you saw those pictures when they found the faces. This is 
one of the face more beautiful. You can see the lips, the nose, the eyes. This is completely negroid face and the weight of this face is 25 tons. We're wondering how they carry in that time, from where they carry these rocks because it's solid. This head they bring from 134 kilometers far from here. Yes. So it hasn't been moved since? No. Was that stone quarried where they found it? Or how far did they have to bring the quarry stone? They say from 100 kilometers far. They call basalt. It is one solid piece from 25 tons. What is the uh, relationship between this head and the uh, African presence in the New World? Well, they showing it to you the exactly origin, Negroi, the basic origin for these peoples. Why do you think they made, uh, they would carve uh, a Negroid head? What would be the significance of that? To, to show uh, when these people was arrived to this continent. They tried to demonstrate when they arrived to America. And that was before Christ. About 1200 years BC was the time when they made uh, these faces. Were these heads looked at as uh, gods, uh, as uh, priests? Uh, priest. They were priests. Priest. So then the African present here was one of priesthood or what? Priest. It was one of priesthood. Yes. Are there any other heads this size for the other races of people? No, this is the most principal. Uh, Dr. Van Sertim, can you make a comment on this? I was asking him the significance of this in terms of the, the importance in the society of these heads, and he was saying that these were represented priests. Yes, these are, this is the priest king class because um, it, it would appear that these people were among the ruling uh, elite of the Olmec. Um, and these heads were revered. In fact, on one of them you have a flat top and you have an altar where people worship. And there is another one in which you have a, a sort of eustachian tube that runs from the air through the mouth so that the priest could stand at the back of the head and talk to the people. It was a kind of oracular thing, you know, a sort of oracle. Um, we'll see this, 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 um, this is one of the, the great heads. And one of the things that you should note too, which many people do not note, is the way that thing falls along the ear. And also note the, in, the, the not the, the markings, the way it is cut, the way it is eroded on top, because the top of the, the helmet is also very important to note um, the things right on the, on, the, on the brow, the way these are formed. Because this is the way in which, e even on top, I don't know how we can get on top there, but there's something quite interesting on the very top of the head. There are certain striations on the top of the head that are also significant. Be <laughs> close attention to everything that is said tonight and that you should prepare yourself to ask questions about the many troubling problems that beset prehistoric America. It is not really prehistoric, it is merely pre-Spanish, but anything that is pre-European is considered to be prehistoric. It is 
the really critical missing pages of history both for America and for Africa. And what I want to do tonight, apart from touching on what we have seen within the last day or two at Mitla and at Monte Alban, what I would like to do is to go on to make a summary of what we have achieved, what we have seen, what we have witnessed in the last week in Mexico. We began in Von Wutenow's studio. Make no mistake, there is no studio in the world where you will find such a collection of African physical types in ancient America. Many of you have not had the opportunity to examine closely at leisure all the pieces in that collection. It is a priceless collection and many of you have raised the question which must be pursued, what will happen when Von Wutenow, who is now 84, dies? What will happen to a collection which is of tremendous significance for us blacks throughout the third world because the likelihood is, as has happened in previous centuries, the likelihood is that all of these marvelous pieces which we have seen and which we have not yet had time to photograph completely and to preserve may disappear. Von Wutenow has, in addition to these little sculptures, he has a catalog of everything he has. Brilliant photographs taken by several professionals over the years. She is apparently the director of the dancing group. And this is a man and his, his features are Totonac, they are not Negroid, but they paint them, ne uh, paint them with Chapopote, so it is a warrior who is black. That is also an atavismo because they knew that the Olmecs were black. You're saying that the Olmec people themselves were black? No, no, no well this one certainly was black, you see, you can't see, and here is the proof for it. It's one of the best proofs I have. This is a figure made that is between the Olmecan period and the Totonacan period, transition period. And this is an Olmec sculpture. And to be black, they covered it with tar. You see, it's a stone head, but it's covered with this tar. So not only the features, and the thick lips come out, primitive, but it is made black. Yes. This, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, this piece was uh, put on the cover of uh, um, uh, Revista of, uh, in Mexico on March, and uh, shows you that another colossal albic head was found in Mexico, which has not been, in my opinion, I, can, I don't know where it is, it's never exhibited. I wonder if they really have excavated it. Of course, you see these, <coughs> there is an item that uh, the people in Tabasco, the Tabasco is, a, is one of the provinces here, I mean, one of the states, the state, just at last, Louisiana is a state. And the people in Tabasco don't want it to disappear from their place to uh, Mexico City. And there are frictions between the Institute of Anthropologia and the state, you see. And that's why I don't know if they've done in the state something about it. In any case, it has not been shown up here in Mexico City. But it is 100% Negroid uh, features, and um, I wish we could get it out and get some of the choice of archaeological sites to link all that we have seen together as a single piece. This is one of the most difficult things to do in Mexico. There is a vast amount of confusion even among the guides who are supposed to have mastered the material in their own area. There is a vast amount of confusion about dates, about the occupation of sites, about the nature of influences, about what the various things we have seen mean. Some of these things cannot yet be explained. Some of these things people can only guess at. But what we are certain of, what we are absolutely certain of, is that the Olmec civilization 
which is the mother of all American civilizations, is not a single stranded civilization. It does not belong to one race. It does not belong to what we conceive of as the Native American who came across the Bering Straits. There obviously were other influences, and among those influences was the African, specifically the Egypto-Nubian of the Mediterranean. When we look in von Wutenow's studio, we see quite a number of heads, most of them pre-classic. By pre-classic is meant periods between, say, about 1000 BC going right down to about 600 BC. This is a significant phase in Olmec civilization. There are several phases of the Olmec. I must deal with phases now, and those of you who are taking notes, please note, because you can get very confused when you see the Olmec appearing in other places in later centuries and becoming mixed up with other peoples. This is some of the things that lead to confusion. We must understand that in the capitals of the Olmec world, in the Olmec morning or the morning of that Olmec world, you have people coming into the site, occupying these sites as early as 1200 BC at La Venta, the holy capital, as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo. Those dates have nothing to do with the actual sculptures, the actual monuments, etc. People walk into a site and start to occupy it because they find there is land there, there they can uh, plow the fields, they can grow crops, they can eat, etc. They don't just walk in today and tomorrow they start building colossal sculptures and massive ceremonial platforms and pyramids, etc. So when people come into a site, it has nothing to do with when the flowering, the high point, the climax of the civilization occurs. The Olmecs came into their sites pretty early, as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo, as early as 1200 BC at La Venta. You must look carefully at this map and see the diamond points. Those are the capitals. And those diamond points show you where the Olmec first made their major settlements. Now it is as early as 1858 that Mexicans became aware of these sites. Remember that just like in Egypt, a great civilization flourished and then died. And then people forgot all about it. The pyramids lay under the sand, the sphinx lay under the sand. Some things stood there like enigmatic witnesses of a glorious past. But many people continued to live for centuries without recovering the majesty of that civilization, without being able to go back to their roots. This is what happened in many of the great cities of the Americas. That for a long time, for centuries, a shadow fell upon this world. Something very unusual seemed to happen somewhere around 8900. Some people put it slightly later, but something very unusual happened in America. It may have been some kind of cataclysm, it may have been an epidemic, it may have been the upheaval, some revolution in which the elite was overthrown and many of the marvelous statues and many of the marvelous platforms were abandoned. We do not know exactly what happened. It was suggested by Victor Damas at Palenque that there was an epidemic of cholera and that could account for the disappearance of people. And that may be a plausible explanation for the disappearance of some of the people from the Mayan sites. But when we come to the Olmec morning, which I want to dwell upon because it affects everything, when Michael Coe and others speak of the Olmec as the mother of American civilization, they are really stating the whole thing in a sentence. It really is. Because in the Olmec morning, on that great platform at, at La Venta, we find quite a number of things that is to affect the civilization centuries afterwards. But let me come back to 1858. 1858 was the discovery at Tres Zapotes of a stone head. Now this is the stone head. This is the first head to be discovered. Now look closely at this head. When the Mexicans saw this head, when their scholars saw this head, scholars like Orozco Ibera, 
Jose Melgar, etc., they were absolutely convinced that there were Africans in America at some ancient time. Why were they convinced? They were convinced by two things. By the African physiognomy, the, 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 the dome of the forehead, the, the cut of the nose, the, the, the jaw, the mouth, etc., but also by something which has never been mentioned in the archaeology for some odd reason. And that is at the back of the stone head there was hair, detailed Ethiopian type hair. No Native American has hair like that. And if that was presented in the archaeology, all this nonsense about babies and jaguars, I have never seen a jaguar with hair like that. And I've never seen a baby with a face like that. People had to find explanations for things they found embarrassing. It is similar to the discovery of the great civilization of Tarseti, the kingdom rather of Tarseti in the Nile Valley which precedes the Egyptian. The man who found the Tarseti, Kitsil, never said a word about it. He died without saying anything. And it was left to Bruce Williams, who many of us will hear in Atlanta in September. It was left to Bruce Williams, his student, to take it out to the back rooms of the University of Chicago Oriental Institute and present it to the world. They said they took, the reason why they delayed so long is because it took 15 years to put the pieces together. Without all those pieces, the stoneware vessels, etc., the pottery that was found, the stone incense burner at the site of Tarseti at Kustal, the site of Kustal, did not need putting together. It was intact from the very beginning. What needed to be put together were their heads. And that was not put together until the head who had a right to put it together died. Thank God. It is absolutely important for us to take a very serious view of this because we find again and again and again that you have a deliberate effort to wipe out the evidence, to hide it, to explain it away. Why is it that this photograph, even now, I am not permitted to use that until 1985 because it involves a whole series of things. But why is it that this head is not among the heads at Villa Hermosa? Is not among the heads in the National Geographic or the Smithsonian or any traveling circus of all McHeads? It is hidden at Tuxla where nobody goes. It's very important to note that that was the first head found and it had a profound effect. Although it was the only thing found at that time that indicated an African influence. It was left to the expeditions of 1938 and 1939, expeditions carried out jointly by the Smithsonian Institute, the University of California, and the National Geographic before they found more of these stone heads. They recovered the one at Tres Zapotes, and then they went on the next year in 1939 they went on to La Venta, and then they found four of these stone heads. They also found, and mo many of you have noted this in the museum at Villa Hermosa, at La Venta Park, you have noted the plan of the city. I want you to look at that plan carefully. There is the first pyramid in America. There is the first step pyramid. There are the arms of the village. And on those arms stand the great stone heads facing the Atlantic Ocean. This is in the Gulf of Mexico. This is at the point which on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico where the, you find the terminus of the Atlantic currents from Africa. Because the currents from Africa take you to northeastern South America, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, swinging towards Florida. And then if you are lucky, if you learn as the Africans were later to learn, perhaps not at this period, you can find a circular current that takes you back towards Europe and Africa. Here at Leventa, they began to see 
a distinctive art style. Here at Leventa, they began to see something in the faces of the monuments, something in the traits, the cultural traits of the Olmec that was to leave its stamp on later civilizations like the Maya, out in Palenque, out in Monte Alban, out in Mitla, even in the evening, the twilight of the gods at Tihotihuacan, out at Tatilco, at Serra de las Misas, in the Monte Alban phase, all of these are branches coming out of the mother culture, the Olmec. And there's something very distinctive. Here, for the first time at Leventa, are the pyramids. Here, for the very first time, is found the sarcophagus, like in Egypt. Here, for the very first time, are monumental stelae and sculptures of colossal proportions. Here, for the very first time, are the great priest kings. Here, for the very first time, are enormous ceremonial temples and altars built to the gods. Some things must be said about the stone heads, which you must note. There is one of them that has a tube running from the air out of the mouth which was featured as an oracle and it has a flat top which functi functioned as an altar. This is very important because it is that kind of oracular um, thing that was found in Egypto Nubian the period. In order for the priest kings of the Egyptians to hold the world together which was being torn apart. The, the Bible describes Egypt at that time like it, it describes it's the great factions and frictions in Egypt at that time. They speak, speak of it as some sort of a torn nation. And in order to pull it together, they had to find once again the power of religion. Religion is responsible for the extraordinary vitality that built the temples and the pyramids and the great tombs of both Egypt and America. Note that. People do not do those extraordinary things. Only giants could do those things. Man becomes a giant when he develops a peculiar kind of focus, when there's a crystallization of his psychic energy. In civilizations that are highly fragmented, that have lost all their certitudes and cannot find again any kind of certitude and focus and power, the tremendous capacity to have the consciousness to operate as a giant is lost. Only giants can build those things. It has nothing to do with size because the American is small in, in size. It has nothing to do with um, machines because the Egyptian machines were crude compared to the machines we have today. It has to do with a peculiar kind of consciousness which made it possible for one to do things so monumental that even we now with our great machines cannot attempt to do what the Africans did. It is so, it, it is so extraordinary that just a few years ago, the American government sent out a team to study how the Egyptians moved heavy objects across the sand. And in spite of all of our technology, when one of the great nuclear things, nuclear reactors were being moved across the deserts, of the desert at, of, at Geri, they used the identical method the ancient Egyptians used. This is the high technology, the 20th century, looking for a method that was the most practical and efficient method for moving a heavy object across the sands. So you're not dealing here with primitives, in spite of the ancient nature, in spite of the time, the prehistoric time of these cultures and civilizations, you're dealing with highly sophisticated people. A state of mind, a consciousness that made it possible for this extraordinary leap to occur. And the peculiar thing about the Olmec is that that leap occurs with all the Egyptian elements in it. It had its own native elements, it had its jaguar. The jaguar is not Egyptian. Nobody in Egypt or Nubia has a jaguar that they worship. There's a little cat cult in Nubia which I noted, but it's not equivalent at all to the great jaguar which prowled the swamps of the Ol Olmec. Why then suddenly they start 
with things which are duplicated nowhere else in the world in such a complex, in such a combination, in such an arbitrary combination. The stelae with the hieroglyphs, the monumental sculptures,